Up your comfort and your savings with the Advantage program from Fraser General Service Experts. With no money down and low monthly payments, our highly qualified home comfort whisperers install your new furnace or AC at no charge, and all future repairs and maintenance are included. You also get new high-efficiency equipment, free 24-7 emergency service, and priority scheduling. You and your wallet will feel the advantage. Call Fraser General Service Experts at 866-EXPERTS or visit Fraser.com to learn more. See website for license details. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where I, Keisha Nicole, delivers a daily dose of passion, purpose, and struggle by interviewing people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here on this podcast, every Oh Hell No moment serves a purpose. Now let's get started with the show. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. So tonight I have a special guest. Her name is Keisha Green, right? You know, Keisha's are the best, right? Because I'm a Keisha too. (laughs) (laughs) And Keisha is an educator. She's an assistant principal. She's an author. And she recently launched a publishing company, and she's also working on a doctoral degree, and she is a mom and a wife. Girl, I thought I had side hustles. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. I'm telling you, it's crazy, but yeah. That's a lot, but that's great though. I mean, it's that's just amazing. So I want to start off by asking you, for your undergrad degree, mm-hmm. did you go to school to become a principal? Was that always your goal? Education was always my passion from my early days. Like my dad was a stickler for education. So I was very passionate about teaching, not necessarily becoming a principal, but definitely committed to teaching. So that's just something that has been instilled in me since I was a little girl growing up. So teaching was definitely something that I wanted to do. And then later on, realizing the impact that principals have on students, you know, as a teacher, you're impacting small groups, students that are limited to your classroom. But as a school building leader, you have the opportunity to impact hundreds of students that walk through your school. So That's what kind of pushed me beyond the walls of my classroom to pursue leadership for schools. Wow, that's really a really profound statement is that you wanted to impact not just a little group, but like a lot of people. And you saw a way to do that by climbing that ladder. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about um, giving some advice to people who might want to take this same path. What would you tell someone who is going to school for education? What would you tell them about being a teacher and, and you know, following that path versus following the path of becoming a principal? So I, I would tell them if anyone is going to college or thinking of college, going to college for education, I would, I would recommend that they do it because our children need us. There's such a large need for great educators that are caring and committed to bringing about equity, especially for students of color, that I would seriously encourage them to go and do just that. And I think that the path is pretty linear, right? So you don't just jump into being a principal. I truly do believe that you need time and experience inside the classroom before taking on a leadership position, because it's easy to get in a high position and forget what it's like to be a teacher. So I think it's important that you start the route of being a teacher because it helps you to develop skills such as empathy and understanding for what teachers are truly going through. And also just having that experience to, you know, be on the ground with your teachers in the classrooms, teaching and delivering lessons. So I think that's an important path to become a teacher before stepping into the leadership role. So is there any other way? Have you ever heard of someone becoming a principal who didn't actually work in the um, classroom prior to taking that role? Honestly, no. But I know that there are many people that transfer from the business world to education and they don't necessarily spend a great deal of time in the classroom. And then they do get to, you know, 
hold leadership positions, but I've never heard of anyone just leaving from one field and just right away transitioning to being a school building leader. Not to say that it's not impossible, but I, I certainly haven't heard of it. Oh, okay. That'd be interesting to find out actually. Yeah, right? Because <laughs> 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 stranger things have happened. Look at the president. You know what I'm saying? I mean, 100%. Yeah. So so what are what are some things that principals are responsible for? So the primary role of principals is to serve as instructional leaders for the building and to ensure the safety of all students while developing adults and building capacity within their building. So that is the primary role of the principal to stand as the face of the building, to create a clear vision and mission for the building that the teachers are going to kind of rally around and work towards And as an instructional lead for the building, supporting students, I'm sorry, supporting teachers in their development so that they can support students. And of course, safety is the number one priority that any principal will tell you about. And I think now it's important that we don't assume that this is happening, but also to ensure equity for all students within their school community. So, you know, for a long time, that was just assumed that that was happening. It was, it was never something that was pointed out that we need equity for all students. But I think now in the world that we're living in today, and especially from what we're seeing today, it's important that leaders stand out and say, hey, I'm developing an anti-racist community that's ensuring equity for all students. And if an educator is not stepping out and saying that clearly and explicitly, I I truly do have a problem with that. Yeah, that's definitely true. So how have you been getting along with this um, whole experience with COVID and having to really pivot and do things different to serve the children and the teachers and and get things done? I'm not even going to lie to you. It's been it's been really, really tough. And I go back and forth with feelings of um, optimism, um, feelings of stress feelings of um we shouldn't be doing this because students aren't safe and teachers aren't safe um staff isn't safe but then again um seeing how the pandemic has kind of shined a spotlight and like brought to the forefront the inequities between different school school districts even inequities within one school community with different families Sometimes it makes me feel like we need to be back in the building so that we could love on our students. We could get to, you know, have face-to-face instruction and teach them there. But also being a COVID survivor myself, I, I honestly experience PTSD from it because I'm fearful, but yet I'm ready to do the work. So I, I'm, I have mixed feelings every day. You ask me tomorrow, I'm like, no, this is the best thing. Virtual learning is going to work. You ask me a week later and I'm back to square one like we got to get back back in the building oh my gosh so I'm happy to hear that you are a COVID survivor but what was that experience like for you you said that you have PTSD like what did you what were your symptoms um I was hospitalized for I think about 14 days oh my god Um, yes so I was very 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 ill. I I wrote a blog about it. So if anybody wants to learn more about it, they can visit keishasblogspot.com to learn. Honestly, I don't talk about it and I don't like reliving it. Okay. Because it brings brings me to like a very dark place. Yeah, no, forget it. Let's stop. (laughs) No. (laughs) All right. So you are here. (laughs) I'm here. By God, I made it. I'm here. That means that God is not finished with me yet. And I have more work to do. So let's get it. Yes, let's keep it positive. So you're going, you're back in school for your doctorate. So what are you studying? I'm studying school policies. I want to learn about policies that are created, who's creating the policies, how are policies being created? Because there are a lot of policies that are created that are seriously harmful to students of color, to um, students that live in marginalized communities. So it's important that we have people that look like us 
that's serving on these boards that truly understand what these communities are going through. The, um, so that when policies are being created, those people, the, the marginalized communities, because people aren't marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. But those communities are not forgotten and that these policies that are created are policies that aren't going to hurt them or further oppress them or hinder them from getting the results that they need as well. So that's why I'm str I'm like, like I said, Betsy DeVos, I'm so glad that she's gone, but she really inspired me to figure this out because I'm like, she has to go. So that's what really made me get into school policy. I want to be on that board creating policies that I know are going to uplift and bring my people through. Wow. That's, I love that. That is so good. Thank so, you. Thank you. So do you have any aspirations of becoming a superintendent? If that's where the trajectory takes me, it seems to be very linear, like I said, right? Yeah. So if that's where it takes me, then by all means, I welcome it. But um, I need to like, kind of get my foot wet as I feel like my feet are already wet as a school as a principal, right? Mm -hmm. So that would just be the next step and then just keep on going from there. So whatever God has in store for me, let's get it. Let's get it. Okay. I see it. Dream so big and dream bigger. So yes, I see it. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about your writing. When did you discover that you enjoyed writing or even enjoy reading enough to delve into, you know, publishing? So like real talk, I've always loved reading. Like as a kid, I devoured reading. I enjoyed reading just, I enjoyed reading Sweet Valley High books. I enjoyed reading um, the Babysitter Club's book. I remember when I got my first library card in elementary school and the first book I picked out from the Mount Vernon Public Library. And I never forgot it to this day. When I tell you that, <laughs> I was like crazy. I remember being in elementary school because, you know, I was an immigrant from Jamaica. So yeah. it wasn't like I grew up here from, you know, kindergarten. I knew about the library and had library cards and so forth. So I got introduced to the library. I went to the Mount Vernon Public Library with my summer reading list. I'll never forget it. When I tell you that teachers make an impact, they really do. The book that I picked out to read my first library book was called The Golden Daffodils. Wow. Yeah, and I just- Crazy that you remember that. That was the first book. And I, it was about a little girl that had cerebral palsy. So even that I remember. Reading was something that I always loved to do. And then- I went to high school at Mount Vernon High School and I had a creative writing course and I used to enjoy writing stories, but I'm like, you know, I can't be an author like that. That doesn't happen. Like that's not going to happen for me. So I left it off and like kind of, you know, the dream was just deferred. Mm -hmm. And as an educator, when it was time for teaching, reading and writing, that was my favorite thing to do with my students. Like I'm all about reading and writing. That's why I call myself the literacy maven. That's the name I gave myself. So um, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I was just always obsessed with reading and writing. That's good though, because those things are important and it's so important to have those skills and be good at them because especially in your field, you know, I'm sure you're communicating all day long verbally and written and, and, you know, those skills have to be up to par. So it fits right in with your life. It definitely does. And you want to know something funny? My eldest son, he loves to read my other two kids. It's like, I'm looking at them. Like, where do y'all come from? Mm -hmm. I have to fight with them to get them to pick up a book, but they'll get it. They're going to find something they love and they'll just go with it. You took me back when you said Sweet Valley High because I used to love those books too. And you know what else? I used to love the Archie um, comics. I used to read those like back to back, like the volumes <laughs> with Archie and Veronica and Betty. So I used to go crazy for those little series books. Like yes. I just loved them. Absolutely loved them. So um, 
gosh. So then you deferred your dream and you pursued your, you know, education ambitions. And when did you say, you know what, I'm going to go back to that dream I had way back when? All right. So like I tell everybody, the George Floyd incident, right? Mm -hmm. That happened. I saw that incident play out on TV. And like, I, when I tell you, I really sat there watching with like bated breath. I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, it was like a train wreck that you couldn't take your eyes off of because I knew what the outcome was going to be. And after watching that incident play out on TV, I was just like, I can't take this anymore. So I wanted to, I, I've always been passionate about race and equity and the liberation of people of color. So I started to think like, because I've, I've kind of always felt hopeless before, like, what can I possibly do? So then I started to think about, well, I'm in education, so I'm making a big impact in education on children's lives, right? So I started to think about the texts that we currently have in schools and how, you know, we're preaching equity, we're preaching culturally responsiveness, we're teaching relevance, but I don't really see a lot of children's picture books that touches on real world issues, such as that that explicitly touches on it such as racism such as the death the loss of a loved one so I decided that I was going to write something about that but the the trick is with my book it's a lot of inferring and it was written that way so that we could really help to identify any cultural blind spots that we hold and any implicit biases that we hold to really uncover those and think about the damage that the media has done, that stereotypes have done with us. So I wanted to touch on relevant issues, but yet do it in such a way that I'm not trying to re-traumatize our children because you know we, we're traumatized enough already with racism. So it's up to them to develop ideas around what's happening in the text with the character and how did things come to be this way? So it's a real discussion piece with the text. Wow, I love that. I love when people um, have these creative ideas on, you know, around educating kids on real world issues. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm telling you, it's, it's, we have to, we have to. We have to find something that teaches them about what's happening in the world while still teaching them the building blocks of what standards have set out for students. So Keisha wrote a book and it's a children's book. So tell us the name of your book and what the story is about. Yes, my baby, my pet project. It's called, his name was Quincy. It's available for purchase on my website at www.jdxpublishingcompanyllc.com or you could find it on Amazon, but I encourage you to visit my website because purchasing from me comes with some extra treats that Amazon just doesn't give, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, some extra special goodies. The synopsis is there's a little boy named Tyreek and in the story, his brother dies. But in, to him, his brother is his hero. So when he wakes up that morning, he wakes up to his family kind of like in turmoil and there's a ruckus going on at the house. Um, and he walks out and he sees his brother's picture on the TV, right? But as a young boy, he doesn't really understand death. And he's just kind of confused as to why is his brother on TV? And why, why, how, why does he look that way? Why, why is he dressed in clothing that doesn't necessarily reflect who he is or his character, right? Mm -hmm. So he's kind of confused as to why they selected that picture to display his brother. And furthermore, he's also confused because they're describing his brother as a thug and he doesn't know what that means. So throughout the, the story, he's really telling the true story of who his brother really was. And at the end of the book, he comes to an understanding of the hashtag, say his name, the reason why it was created and the importance of why that hashtag was created um, in an effort to not erase who our loved ones are when they die. So 
it's it's more than just this person. No, this person has a name. This person has a family that loves them. So at the end of the text, there's a call for social justice where, you know, he's saying, say my brother's name, say his name. Don't forget who he was or who he is. Well, was. So that's what the text is about. So it is a sad story, but it touches on Black family values. It touches on Black family love. It touches on dealing with death. It touches on identifying stereotypes and kind of finding out how the media perpetuates these stereotypes and how we do have to be the narrators of our own stories to tell about our loved ones so that they're not portrayed negatively by the media like we so often see it, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I remember what really made me, and I don't know why I always forget this young man's name. It's like Brown. What's his, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Brown. And I think that's when I remember watching the news and he was killed. I can't remember where he was killed, but he was shot by the police. And on TV, it was something about some incident that happened inside a store. And he left this, Mike Brown. Yeah, Michael Brown. Michael Brown. So I remember watching the news when the incident happened. And I remember them showing a picture of him. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, and they showed what happened. And then I remember later on seeing a picture of him in a graduation cap and gown and his mom, I will never, it's green. It's funny the things that kind of resonate with you and stick with you. And he was wearing like a green graduation cap and gown. And I said, wow, that's a very different, that's a stark contrast between the picture that they used to show him versus the picture that his mother has, you know? And I was like, I know exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it. And it's it's just adding more fuel to the fire. It's like gaslighting so that people continue to see Blacks as, you know, so when something happens to them, so like he was a thug anyway, like look at him. And that's not true. Right. He was a lot of things to a lot of different people. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great story. So writing the book, you decided to start your own publishing company to publish the book. Um, Why did you choose to go that route instead of just maybe, you know, having someone else publish it for you or doing it another way? So one reason was I wanted creative control. Mm -hmm. The second reason, I didn't want anybody to change it. I didn't want it to, I didn't want the message to be watered down. I didn't want the characters to be changed. I wanted creative control. The second reason was that this is a pressing issue and it's very relevant. So I didn't want to wait a long time trying to get it out to traditional publishing companies. The next thing with traditional publishing companies, you often need a middleman, a literary agent that's going to go between you and the publishing company to get your work out there. Um. And let, let's think about the history of publishing companies. Not many Black authors, unless you have a large audience, already a large following, oftentimes it's, it's very unlikely that your work is going to be picked up. So when we think about schools, right? And there was a research done a couple of years ago, and I believe it was something like, it was under 25% of books that were written by people of color that had, that portrayed characters of colors, of color. So there was a lack of representation in text. And how did that happen? So I'm thinking that there's already kind of a block or a limitation to Black authors getting deals with publishing companies. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and like put my own money towards this and get this work out. And that's why I decided to go the self-publishing route Mm -hmm. versus the traditional route. So what are some struggles that you've had starting your own publishing company and actually writing and publishing your own book? Oh my God, let's talk about marketing. Let's talk about getting the word out there, period, that a text of this magnitude exists 
Mm-hmm. That is the most difficult thing to do is to kind of get the word out there on a large scale that this book is here. It belongs in schools. It, it fits being in education for what over 20 years now. I know exactly what teachers are looking for when they're using mentor texts. I know standards that they have to teach. So this book was written in a very deliberate and specific way. But besides my friends and my social media following, very few people know that this text is even out there. So I think that's the hardest part about taking the self-publishing route. You have to have money for advertisement. You need a team, a launch team that can help you get the word out there that this book exists. I don't even know what else to do at this point, but I I think that's the hardest thing. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. Marketing is very hard for, you know, everyone, even for me with a podcast, it's really hard to, um, you know, get my podcast out there. You know, there are so many people with podcasts now, every day a podcast is launching, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing, but I feel like it's just a slow and steady climb and it'll get there. Definitely. Definitely. So are you interested in publishing books for other people? Like what is your plan for your publishing company? The plan for my publishing company is really to create books for people of color. Mm -hmm. And this is what's so funny to me, right? And this is where entitlement and like, I'm not white. So no matter how hard I study white culture, no matter how many white friends I have, no matter how much I think I'm white, no matter how much I cannot give you a true white experience when writing a book about a white family, right? Mm So I could only write about what I, I, this is my belief. I don't know about anybody else's. I want to write about what I know, what's true to me. So I want to create books for people of color. I want to write fiction stories later on. Recently, I've been thinking about writing educational books to support teachers, but I I don't know how I feel about that right now. I want to kind of stick in this realm Mm -hmm. and just work on writing children's books for people of color. That's my focus. I love it. And then you also have the Caribbean, you know, background too. So that's really good to, to, you know, write about Caribbean. Jamaican born and bred. That's right, girl. Big up yourself. You know, my people (laughs) Jamaican too. All right. (laughs) Yes. 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 I love when my Caribbean people come on my podcast, have to big them up, but yeah, you can definitely, you know, um, expose people to that as well, you know? So I think, I think you have a great thing going on here. Girl, you read in my mind. You yeah. want to know what's so funny? Like my husband is always asking me like, babe, what's your next book? What's your next book? And my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, whom I love dearly, she raised us. Like, you know, my mother came to America when we were very young. Mm-hmm. So we were left in Jamaica with my dad and my grandmother and my uncles and my aunts. But my grandmother, and we called her mama, mama and papa, they both passed. Like when people say like, where do you get your inspiration from? I don't know. It just came to me. And I really want to write kind of like a memoir about her. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, something, a book about her. Because like the love is just timeless. I want to do something that honors her and honors her memory. Yeah, I love that. I think that will be so sweet. And I feel like a lot of people, even, you know, American people and Caribbean people especially have very close relationships with their grandparents. And Mm -hmm. I think that that would be a really great book. You should do it. I'm definitely going to do it. Like when I think about the traditions and, you know, like living in Kingston, but then going to the country to spend time with her during Christmas Mm -hmm. and just you know, the way that grandparents like really care for you. So yeah. when we talk about black culture, like family, the village is a big one. Yeah. And you want to know what's so funny when my grandmother passed a cousin, me and one of my cousins named Munchie, we were having a conversation and she was like, man, I can't believe she's gone. Like she, I was her favorite. And I looked and I'm like, what? You were her favorite? <laughs> like I was her favorite. And then 
even getting with the other grandkids in Jamaica when we went to bury her. And they were like, no, I'm her favorite. I'm like, what? (laughs) So she had a very special way, I guess, of making us all feel like we were the favorites. Yeah. She's making it. Yes, that's, that's a must. You must do that. So my podcast, I focus on passion, purpose, struggle. Do you feel like you are doing your purpose work, working in education, and now with the launch of your publishing company, do you feel like you are definitely living in your purpose? I do. I do. And It's funny, you know, they say you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I've always wanted to do education and law. Law is my second passion. As a little girl, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a lawyer because I'm going to make all this money and I'm going to be a lawyer. And, you know, I remember my mom was like, yeah, maybe you should because you always argue and like you should go into law. the same thing my mom used to tell me. (laughs) It must be the Keisha's. (laughs) Or it must be a Jamaican thing. That must be a cultural thing, right? Right. So what's so funny is that, was it, I actually, and if you even see on my personal Instagram, you'll see up there that I have soon to be a lawyer. I started taking classes for law school. When? I think this was two summers ago. I would probably have to go back and look. So I was taking it wasn't classes actually it was a preparation course that was helping me to get ready to take the LSAT so that I can get into law school. And I started that summer. I went to all of the classes and got ready to take my LSAT. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go into law. And then I said, like, God, like, show me my purpose. Like, what is it? And the funny thing is, I think I'm still going through my purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, but in light of everything that happened, I'm just like, no, I got to stay in education. And like, this is a way laws for somebody else, you know, everybody has to do their part. So oftentimes I'll often speak about like position yourselves. People of color need to position themselves in places where we could help to liberate our people. And I, you know what? God has somebody else for the field of law and I'm here for education. So I'm looking into doing a lot of consulting work. Mm -hmm. I want to do a lot of consultation work with school building leaders to help develop teachers so that they can start to get on this, you know, this path of liberating and creating anti-racist, anti-bias spaces that are safe for children of color. So that's what I'm getting my foot into now, because I already do it in my own building. Might as well go out there and do it for other school building leaders that are so consumed and have their hands tied up and you know so I want to go into I'm going into it's not even that I want to I've started and launched some consultation work that I'm starting to take on that's amazing girl you are a phenomenal woman okay thank you (laughs) for sure So this is the Oh Hell No podcast. So you have to share an Oh Hell No moment with us that has taught you something or changed your perspective on something. And of course, an Oh Hell No moment is a moment of shock or disbelief. And you say to yourself, Oh Hell No. But it could propel you to, you know, new heights, better things, or, you know, different opportunities. So share something with us that was, really um pivotal in your life or that you know you take with you every day um can anything be as oh hell no as today yeah Uh, anything (laughs) I know I know uh, (laughs) no (laughs) that's a tough one wait a minute uh an oh hell no moment that kind of like pivoted me and or it taught you something or it changed your perspective on something. So this moment happened in your life and it just shifted things for you. And maybe you learned a lesson from it. Maybe you, you know, just something. And we have oh hell no moments all the time. Like this is always happening to us. But some of those moments are really monumental where you're like, yo, in that moment I knew or you know, in that moment, I changed my life, you know, something really meaty. Give us the tea, girl. All right. So this is the tea, right? And this, this is reality. 
and oh hell no moment was Trayvon Martin. Oh God, yeah. It was at that moment that I remember going to some training and somebody said, when is the moment you realized you were black? And I was like, what? That's a weird question. Like I've always been black. And they were like, no, think back to a moment when you realized that you were black. And this is why I say the Trayvon Martin murder. Because I grew up in a very, you know, safe. We, we, we didn't necessarily struggle. Um, grew up in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Just always felt like, oh no, like, you know, we're safe. Like everybody, this is okay. Right. And it was at that moment when Trayvon Martin was killed. And I'm thinking about my son who loves to wear hoodies. And they wear hoodies for different reasons, for insecurities, for trauma, whatever the case may be, style, fashion. Mm -hmm. People have a lot of different reasons for wearing them. And I remember saying to him, and I sat him down, and I'll never forget, I said to him, I don't want you to wear hoodies anymore. In fact, I stopped buying him hoodies. And he understood why I didn't want him to wear a hoodie, Mm -hmm. but it was at that moment that I realized, like, really connecting my son to, you know, this is a kid that loves to wear hoodies. He loves Arizona iced teas. Um, And thinking about the fact that he could be outside in the street and someone not know him. um, He's, he's a very humble young man, very quiet, very respectful, you know, brought up in a good family. We, we have great family values. We, we love our children. We pray, we go to church, they're enrolled in sports. We put them in the best schools. And that at the end of the day, none of that matters. Yeah. Like none of that matters because somebody's going to see him on the street, not know who he is, not understand his background, not understand his story. And in the blink of an eye, just because of the color of his skin, his life could be taken. And that was my true, oh, hell no moment. I, I have, oh, hell no moments every day. I have a 16-year-old, I have a nine-year-old, and he's 25. But when I think back, that was definitely one of my, oh, hell no moments. Yeah, definitely was. Like, that was just horrific for me. I just couldn't even mm-hmm. look at the pictures. Like, I mean, uh-huh. even to this day, it sickens my stomach that those parents had to bury their child. Like, it's just, I mean, and it just continues yeah. to happen, you know? So it, it, it's insane. It's, it's you know, but all we, we all we could do is pray, right? Yep. Well, we it was, make it. <laughs> we can't make it. Yeah, I think we will. It was such a pleasure having you on this show. Please tell everyone again where they can learn more about you, find your book and um, stay engaged with all of these amazing things that you have going on. Okay. I don't know why, but I'm just sitting here dancing right now. So <laughs> you, can, you can find more information about me. You can follow me on Instagram at JDX Publishing, Twitter, and Facebook at JDX Publishing. My book is available at my website at www.jdx. Touch free payments from PayPal, a safe way for your customers to pay. Simply download the PayPal app and display your own unique QR code for your customers to scan. Whether you're a market seller, I'll take two tomatoes and a cucumber. poodle pamperer, <laughs> piano tuner, or plumber, signing up to accept touch free payments for your business is easy. Touch free QR code payments. Shop safe with PayPal.
New Extra Charge Hot and Iced Coffee from Dunkin' is made with 20% extra caffeine from green coffee extract because we could all use a little extra this year. Whether that's an extra boost, some extra boldness, or the drive to go the extra mile. We're extra ready for whatever comes our way and extra excited to take it on. Let's get it done with a medium extra charged coffee from Dunkin' for $2 with 20% more caffeine. And pair it with snackable stuffed bagel minis for an added all-day boost. Order ahead on the Dunkin' app. America runs on Dunkin'. Participation may vary. Limited time offer.